Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The debate over a vote to repeal police officers' collective bargaining power is in full swing in San Antonio. The supporters of Proposition B say it's a step toward more control, while opponents say keeping and recruiting officers would be harder if it passes. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us what changes if Prop B does pass. The city and the San Antonio Police Officers Association are in the middle of renegotiating the police contract, but a vote on May 1st could stop those talks in their tracks, leaving the current contract to expire on September 30th. In absence of a new deal, the various provisions negotiated over past union contracts would go away. Rules on things like promotions, hiring, and discipline would then be dictated by a part of state law, Chapter 143, known as civil service. Pay and health benefits, though, will largely be up to the city. There's no requirement in 143 to any level. Mm -hmm. of pay. Gotcha. So that's, you just start back at ground zero, if you will. There is another way for officers to negotiate with the city, known as meet and confer. It's used in some other big Texas police departments like Austin and Houston, but it's not automatic. It requires a petition process by officers and a vote by either the city council or the whole city before it can be put into use. The activist group Fix SAPD, which got Prop B onto the ballot, has said it supports the use of meet and confer. But the head of the Combined Law Enforcement Associations of Texas, of which the local union's an affiliate, is skeptical about the political reality of that happening. Why would you, you, you know, turn around and go right back into contract negotiations when the public has publicly said we don't want contract negotiations in San Antonio. A meet and confer doesn't guarantee either side comes to the table, as there's nothing to force them like there is with collective bargaining. Nothing but their own interest. So they have they have a heavy interest in talking to one another and fixing problems, and this gives them the tool. But for now, the union's focused on using the tool it has, collective bargaining, which depending on how soon a deal is hammered out, could give them a new contract no matter which way the May 1st vote goes. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. To the border now in a nonprofit organization in Eagle Pass, working closely with Border Patrol and helping asylum seekers that are being released. The organization Mission Border Hope, offering people showers, meals, a place to stay. They also offer phone calls, Wi-Fi, and translators so they can call families. Valeria Wheeler, the executive director, says they are seeing an average of 50 people a day in Eagle Pass. Some days we are full of people, like full of people. Um, but of course, it's, it's a lot of family units, people with little children, pregnant moms. More than 100,000 people were apprehended on the southwest border in February, according to Customs and Border Protection. And today, Governor Greg Abbott addressed the increase of migrants crossing the border, specifically unaccompanied minors that need help from places like Mission Border Hope. Governor Abbott blaming the surge on what he called President border Biden's open border policies. He says Texans deserve a plan and answers. How long will these children be here? What countries have they come from and what COVID variants have they been exposed to? During that press conference, the governor also expanding Operation Lone Star to assist with the migrant children at the border. By the way, the Biden administration does not have an open borders policy. The president has pledged to treat migrants more humanely than his predecessor and has asked FEMA to help with border operations and housing unaccompanied minors. This week, we've been asking for your questions and concerns about pregnancy during this pandemic. Our Courtney Friedman is getting those answers. She spoke to a leading maternal fetal medicine doctor about the subject brought up the most, the vaccine and how they compare. In the medical world, the consensus is clear. We know the risks for mom related to COVID-19 are substantial. Uh, we are still in the middle of the pandemic. We are advising pregnant women uh, to, to get the vaccine whenever it's available to them. Dr. Patrick Ramsey is the maternal fetal medicine director working at both University Hospital and UT Health San Antonio. We have some experience now from the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Over 10,000 women have received it, and we have not seen any significant pregnancy complications related to the vaccine. But if you do get Johnson & Johnson, they have come out and said that it's safe, correct? Yes, it's, they've come out and said it's safe. He says there isn't as much research yet, but it's a more traditionally made vaccine, like the ones used for the flu or measles, which are always recommended for pregnant women. The type of vaccines that these are are not live virus vaccines and should be safe to use in pregnancy. 
Soon, evidence will be even more concrete as companies begin vaccine trials specifically for pregnant women. We're fortunate here at UT and UHS that we're going to be part of the Pfizer pregnancy trial. We're in the final stages of getting approval from our institution to initiate, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. He believes with an international study being done in hundreds of centers across the world, they could have results about safety and efficacy as soon as midsummer. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And coming up Sunday at 10 o'clock, Dr. Ramsey answers even more of your questions about how much protection the vaccine may be able to offer your baby before and after birth. If you'd like to send in a question, you can find this story on our website at ksat.com. Scroll to the bottom of that article and write your questions there. The police are asking for your help in finding a robbery suspect. The incident happened on March 13th at a cell phone store in the 5900 block of Ingram Road. Police say the suspect threatened the clerk, demanded money before leaving on foot. If you can help police with either of these cases, call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. It is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and COVID-19 shutdowns have pushed voluntary procedures like colonoscopies to the back burner. But the medical community is urging procrastinators to get a move on. Ursula Perry explains the consequences of delaying this procedure. If you're 45, it's your turn. If you're 45 and you have a family history of colon cancer or polyps, you're probably overdue. You know, it's the only advantage we have over this particular cancer is it takes a long time for it to go from regular to a little bit precancerous to a little bit more scary. That whole process does not happen overnight. That's the good news. To go all the way to a cancer, that's generally thought to be about a 10 year window. So even if you missed a few years or, of course, what we've been talking about has happened more recently, you still got the time to do it. Clinics like gastroenterology consultants of San Antonio work in partnership with their colleagues at other practices, and many are open on the weekends, just in case you can't interrupt your work week with that pre-treatment the day before. It's a little bit harder because of the stuff you have to drink the night before. But once you're here, you're here for about two hours. We give you a little sedation for about 20 minutes. And it lets us take those little things out of there. If small polyps are found, usually the doctor can remove them right then and there. They're then sent off to a lab to be examined for cancer. If no polyps are found, your doctor will probably tell you they don't need to see you for seven to 10 years. If polyps are found or you have a history of this in your family, they'll probably say they need to see you again in three to five years. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Several Rio Grande Valley cemeteries, the final resting place for African Americans who settled there prior to the Civil War. One of many forgotten African American cemeteries sits between Far and San Juan. Jesse DeGriado tells us about the proposal for a federal database of African American cemeteries. Walking through one of the Jackson family cemeteries as a child, Ramiro Ramirez would ask his grandmother. Well, what are these unmarked graves? She said she would say, that these are people that came with us from Alabama. With his grandfather, Martin Jackson, the son of a white man and a black slave who are buried in the family cemetery compound. His great-grandparents, Nathaniel and Matilda Jackson, had fled the South before the Civil War and even helped others flee into Mexico. Their history, part of a recent documentary, Just a Fairy Ride to Freedom. It's said they even established the first Protestant church in South Texas, adjacent to one of two Jackson family cemeteries, both within sight of construction on a border wall that's now at a standstill. They've always been cared for, unlike so many others. Certainly, the, the African-American cemeteries uh, uh, happen to be some of the most overlooked. If Congress adopts it, the proposed African-American Burial Grounds Network Act would create a national database of those cemeteries. An advisor on the proposed legislation, Everett Fly is nationally known for his work in finding and restoring cemeteries. Many of the burials don't have headstones. Um, a lot of folks have lost track of who's buried there, but we know that there are cemeteries. Fly says a historical record of perhaps thousands of African-American cemeteries would be invaluable to researchers and families alike. Now more than ever, UTRGV anthropologist Roseanne Bachagarza says people are curious. They want to know who they are and where they came from. If the database comes to pass, the Jackson family wants to be included to further preserve their history. So very much so the answer is yes. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. 
look outside with live cam this evening. 79 degrees right now. It's been a beautiful day in San Antonio, but those winds, they've been wild at times, Adam. Yeah, we topped out at about 41 miles per hour earlier today, and we're still seeing some gusts in excess of 30 here in San Antonio. Temperature wise, we started the day at 60, made it up to 81 for the afternoon high temperature. And you look at our pollen count, just a laundry list. Hackberry, mulberry, moderate, mold oak, grass and ash on the low end, but oak season is starting to ramp up. There's those gusty northwesterly winds right now gusts 30 to 35 miles per hour. This is going to be the case through the night and into tomorrow, but tomorrow we'll see the wind start to pump the brakes a little bit, but a noticeable breeze through the night, just not as bad as what we had during the day. That wind is blowing in some West Texas dust. A closer look at this and we'll talk about how long this comfortable lack of humidity is going to last coming up. The number of people vaccinated in our community continues to go up, but the supply of vaccines needs to go up as well. That's a message we have heard over and over again in these last couple of daily briefings. Yeah, and when you listen to the county judge and the mayor, they are putting that blame on the state. They say they're asking the state for more vaccines or maybe a federal mega site that we've seen like in Houston. So it'll be interesting to see if there's any movement on that. Let's go live now to City Hall. Anita Curran, our assistant director of San Antonio Metro Health, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 186 new cases of COVID-19, which brings the total to 201,196. Our seven-day rolling average currently is 187. Sadly, we are reporting four new deaths tonight. We've lost a total of 2,995 of our neighbors and friends and family members to COVID-19. Remember, please keep their loved ones in your thoughts and prayers this evening. Each one of these losses is tremendous for every family that's suffering during this pandemic. Over in our hospitals, uh, there is uh, steadiness and uh, there are 208 COVID-19 patients in our local hospitals tonight, continuing the trends that we're seeing. Uh, in the last 24 hours, there had been 31 new admissions, 74 patients in the ICU and 42 patients are on ventilators this evening. Remember that our fight against COVID-19 is not over. We say that every night and it's important that we keep that in mind. Wear your mask, practice social distancing, wash your hands and get vaccinated when it's your turn. And speaking of vaccinations, as of yesterday in Bear County, we've had 378,521 people have received their first dose and 210,320 people who are fully vaccinated as of today. So uh, let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thank you. Uh, following up on the vaccines uh, out at the uh, Wonderland and then the uh, hospital we got downtown, the Bear County Hospital District uh, has really been picking up here lately. Uh, the last three days, we've done over 7,000 a day for 21,000. And we expect that to continue for the next two days and hopefully into next uh, next week. Uh, today, but before the end of the day, we will break having over 200,000 people uh, between Wonderland and our downtown hospitals. So again, thanks to George Hernandez and his team at University Hospital for the great, um, great job they're doing. Uh, the mayor was commenting on how many uh, good citizens that we've lost to COVID, <clears throat> right at 3,000, 2,900 and something. But what, what most people don't really realize that's just the tip of the iceberg uh, through February the 28th we've had over 8,000 people go to the hospital you don't go to the hospital unless you're pretty darn sick and then a lot of them of course uh, are in ICU and ventilators and then a number of other people that get COVID uh, maybe they stay home maybe they get over it but they carry the symptoms for a very very long period of time so it's it's been a, a real devastating strike to us and one that we still don't know the long-term consequences on. So, like the mayor says, uh, we still need to be careful. Uh, we still have a lot more people we got to get vaccinated before we get out of this um, uh, problem with COVID. So, uh, continue to be careful. All right. Thank you, Judge. And we do want to remind you again, if you are struggling uh, through this pandemic, paying the rent or mortgage, there is assistance available to you. The city and the county are working together on an emergency housing assistance program uh, that you can access by calling 311 or going to the website covid19.sanantonio.gov. 
also if you're out of work. All right, roughly 210,000 people now fully vaccinated in our community. That was a little more than 4,000 more than he reported yesterday, the mayor. As far as the numbers go today, 186 new cases confirmed, and the mayor saying the numbers in the hospital staying roughly steady at this point. Yeah, and, and you heard the county judge there say, that at the county facilities, they are immunizing 7,000 people a day, that they've done 21,000 people so far. That's an increase than what they've been seeing. So hopefully that's a trend that continues. We see more and more people get vaccinated as this thing plays out. All right, let's switch over to weather right now and talk about the fact it was a windy day. Hopefully the wind's going to die down. Is it already, Adam? The wind, no, it's still howling out there. We're gusting up to about 35 miles per hour for most of South Texas and periodically will measure a gust of 40. Now, this is what's interesting with those winds coming out of the north, out of the northwest. Take a look at that dirt, the dust that's in the air coming in from West Texas. I mean, we're talking Odessa, Midland, Big Spring, San Angelo. You can see this is not clouds. This is the dust. It's already moving through the hill country. It's about to make it to San Antonio. So if you're sensitive to that West Texas dust that's, that often blows into town, well, you will notice that later on tonight. So that gusty wind uh, doing more than just one thing out there, more than just blowing in some cooler air, but also blowing in some West Texas dust. So something to just keep in the back of your mind. We came close to some rainfall earlier today. I mean, we had some showers, but the good rain was all off to the north of San Antonio, and the line really broke apart this morning as it moved into town. But we had a few hundredths of an inch here and there. The main activity far to the east of us. That's actually the severe weather. Mississippi, Alabama, that's the severe zone today. And then tomorrow moves closer to the southeastern states of North Carolina and especially South Carolina. But that's the severe zone with this system on the back side of it. Even some snow in the panhandle of Texas. So the cooler air on the back side transitioning this to snow and they had upwards of six to even eight inches in and around parts of Amarillo and Dalhart area there in the northern panhandle. This evening, temperatures falling off. We're mostly in the 70s now. We'll be down into the 60s by 8 p.m. 10 p.m. low 60s, still breezy, some gusts up to 30 miles per hour, and that lack of humidity in the air, very dry air in place. 45 tomorrow morning, so a bit of a chill in the air. Jacket weather to start the day, but then sunny and 73 by the afternoon. So a beautiful day with some gusts, though, up to 30 miles per hour. So not as windy, but still a little breezy out there. Looking ahead, temperatures don't change much. We'll have mornings in the low to mid 40s, afternoons, lower 70s, a lot of sunshine on the way all the way into the weekend. But the wind will really start pumping the brakes late tomorrow and into Friday. With that lack of humidity, there's unfortunately no chance of rain until we get to about Monday night, a slight chance then. A stretch of nice days, though. Thanks, Adam. All right, he's not Drew my banks. He's not <laughs> Drew our banks. He is Drew Eubanks. Drew Eubanks. And he is playing well at the backup center spot. Yeah, he is certainly taking advantage of the fact that LaMarcus Aldridge is no longer with the Spurs. His minutes have increased, so Drew is putting up some pretty big numbers. And... Southside quarterback Richard Torres is a wanted man. We got the details coming up. Chicago to face the Bulls in their only regular season visit to the Windy City. Chicago is 18 and 20 this season, while San Antonio is 10 and 4 against teams under 500. Now that LaMarcus Aldridge is no longer with the Spurs, big man Drew Eubanks is getting more playing time and he's taking advantage, averaging some big numbers in several categories, including points, rebounds, and blocks per game. Yaka Pertl says he has good chemistry with Drew. I've known Drew, like I played against him in college. Uh, I think we, we get along really well off the court as well. So, um, yeah, like I said, he's he works very hard. He plays very hard and strong, and it's it's tough to guard him, even in practice, because he, he just goes at you all game long. So I, I think, yeah, um, we're going to do just fine. Tip is tonight at 7 in Chicago. We'll have more on the night beat. Today we got to check out the basketball courts inside the Alamo Dome ahead of the NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Championship. Six championship rounds featuring 63 games will be played using five venues and six courts in San Antonio, Austin, and San Marcos, with the Alamo Dome hosting two of those courts. 
got a full-size arena on the south, full-size arena on the north. They'll convert once again as soon as the uh, Sweet 16 games are over. They'll bring that other set of bleachers up to, to you know, round out the full arena configuration here, and uh, it's going to be beautiful. The decor will change by then. Um, we'll just we'll keep changing after every round. First round action begins Sunday morning at 11. Southside Cardinals quarterback Richard Torres is blowing up. The six foot six quarterback has seen his stock take off this spring. He says he came on the picture late, but his buddy Chris made a highlight tape of him and college scouts and coaches are taking notice. 24 seven sports lists him as a three star quarterback with eight division one offers from the likes of UTSA, Nebraska and Washington State. Yesterday alone, he got offers from Tulsa and Kansas State. He's helping to shine a spotlight on Southside and he loves it. Uh, that's big to me, you know, because the community, that's, that's why I play, you know, this is why I play football for my family, my community. I just, I love the energy it brings and I love just putting on the show for them, so it's pretty good. Richie deserves everything he gets. Richie's really talented, he puts in a lot of work and he deserves it all. Tomorrow we'll have more with Richard and Caleb and what they'll miss about each other on the field. Some great things are going on at St. John Paul the Second Catholic High School. They broke ground on a new 25,000 square foot competition gymnasium. The school started in 2009 and the plans for the gym started then. This is a special project of the Archdiocese on the way on delay capital campaign within the Archdiocese of San Antonio. JP2 received a grant from them and started fundraising $4.6 million. This is extremely important for us because we have not had a home game since we started the school. We have a no gymnasium for our competitions um, or for our community events. So we're very excited that we will have for the first time home games here on the school and we believe it will be a huge community builder for um, our students and parents and community. Layman Gonzalez thanked all the donors who made this possible and said they hope to have the gym up and running for basketball in the fall. And that is going to be a beautiful facility. They have never had a home game there. I know it's mind blowing, right? Yeah, mm, that's wild. get that gym built. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. Today's a day all about green, but there was a whole lot of brown in San Antonio yeah. after the snow and ice we saw a month ago. A lot of questions about what survived in our yards and what to do with what's left now. So to answer those, we have David Rodriguez, a horticulturalist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Bear County, joining us now in today's Q&A. Thanks so much for being here. First Thank question, you first question to you. How do you know if something made it or not at this point? Yeah, you're right. It's been about a month and uh, we're on the right track. Today's St. Patrick's Day, so we need to start greening up and spring starts Saturday. So we've uh, been really very unusual hard freeze that we had. And uh, we can kind of talk about palm trees, you know, palms in general and sago palms, which are like uh, palm like plants. If you have not done so, as long as the main trunk is nice and sturdy and the center does not pull out where the new growth comes out of, we want to, if you have not done so, completely remove 100% of all the dead leaves, the fronds. If there's any green, just leave the green. And like palms and many other plants, uh, we'll say early May, if the new growth doesn't come out by May, we might have to do some uh, replacements at that time and then uh, citrus you know a lot of people grow a lot of citrus yeah trees around here and our valley didn't get hit hard in our grapefruit industry but a lot of backyard gardeners are probably going to lose a lot of citrus trees so on citrus and a lot of these um, evergreen shrub types um, go ahead and cut into with your fingernail in the wood the bark and if there's any green on it, uh, wait on citrus until new growth tries to push in the springtime. Um, citrus are grafted trees and they have a very aggressive rootstock. And we're gonna see a lot of the shoots emerge from the very bottom and we don't want that to take the tree. So we need to, to remove those for sure. And David. only prune citrus when the new growth starts coming out. 
David, you know, I, I'm guessing since some of my plants blew away today that they're not going to make it. But uh, <laughs> we, when we're talking about even turf grass, when we're talking about a lawn, is that something we need to worry about with all the cold weather? And what's the best thing we can do to help our lawns, you know, yeah. now so, before before we get yes. too much into the season? Definitely. So we we grow warm season turf grasses, uh, St. Augustine, which is a coarse blade grass should be waking up right now you should see uh, the blade screening up because it typically doesn't go completely dormant zosia and bermuda lawn should be waking up here pretty soon now if you have lots of green green and it, you know it's not the turf grass waking up it's probably winter weeds that are trying to push flowers and seeds out and um, we need to pull those out mow those out as much as possible and core aeration, which is a machine that extracts a, a core of soil, a three-inch core of soil out, you can do that this week and put a lawn dressing out there, compost lawn dressing. And then we want to look at the lawns around mid-April, early May at the latest, keep the weeds in check, of course, and then fertilize um, at that time frame, probably after the second mowing, after these lawns wake up and start active growth for the springtime. If you have predominantly weeds over lawn, look at it again in two weeks. You might have to kill out, remove the weeds, and we might have to do some spot resodding of some of these lawns here and there. So I'm, I'm curious if the snow and ice is going to affect when we can plant in the spring. A lot of people looking around at their yard saying, I need some help. So is now the time or are we close to the time of when it's all right to start planting? I tell you what, with uh, the bad hair day today and the temperatures <laughs> that y'all been giving us, this is good planting time. You know, St. Patty's Day is today. Saturday's the start of spring. All we need uh, is y'all uh, call up some good rain for us. But I, I think it's a good time. You know, this is a good time to get your first wave of spring tomatoes planted. And but we want to tell folks on a lot of these perennials and shrubs. You know that have been cut back to the green wood or basically to ground level don't replace those right away let's wait about may and if you don't see good active new growth return on these plants uh, then you might do some spot replacement in may and then the big test on a lot of other plants particularly evergreen shrubs after they're cut back hopefully to the green wood is if they can make it through the heat of july and august and they have to look good in september Otherwise, some of those plants also might need to be replaced in the fall time. Interesting. So don't replace anything right now is basically what you're saying. Yeah, perennials that are cut back to the ground, let's be patient. Evergreen shrubs and other uh, plant species, if you see green in the bark, cut them back to the greenwood. And let's just be patient and see how they come out by May. And then we'll go from there if we do need to do replacements if they don't look pretty by then. All right, so many of us in the same boat. David, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. David Rodriguez, horticulturalist with Texas A&M San Antonio. And David, Thank I'll you. talk to Adam Kasky and tell him you need some rain. We all need some <laughs> yeah, rain for our place, so I'll, I'll put a word in for you. <laughs> Thank have, you. Appreciate have, it. Have a great one. Pleasure being with you. you. Too. Thank you. We'll be right back. A Wingstop customer caught on camera causing quite a scene after the restaurant got his order wrong in California. In the beginning of the video, you see the man arguing with the workers about wanting a refund. The manager told the man they don't do refunds for online orders. Moments later, the man is seen pulling the register from the counter, throwing it on the ground several times before he threw it through the glass window. Police are looking for this man. The manager says damages are about $6,000 to the swing stop. The court documents show a quadruple homicide in Indianapolis over the weekend began with an argument over a stimulus check. Authorities say a man shot the mother of his child who survived and fatally shot four others, including a seven-year-old girl. When the argument between the suspect and his girlfriend over her stimulus money turned violent, Police say the suspect fled with the couple's six-month-old child. Police found him. They admitted, they say he admitted rather that he shot everyone and took the money. Preliminary charges against the suspect include four counts of murder, a count of attempted murder, and a count of robbery. Take a look at live cam, 77 degrees out there, you know. 
we just had a nice string of sun. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah, and we just got clipped by a little bit of rain earlier today. Most of that action was off to the north of us, a few hundredths of an inch here and there. At the airport in town, we picked up two hundredths of an inch. Up near 80 for the high temperature after a morning low of 60. And we had some wide ranging temperatures. Catula 86, Beeville topped out at 88. Meanwhile, 72 the high in Kerrville and 68 Rock Springs. It's the cold front that caused such wide ranging temperatures across the whole state of Texas. Panhandle in the 30s, for example. Right now we're at 76 in town by 10 p.m. 62. A pleasant evening, but you'll notice the wind tonight, even on into tomorrow. That wind is blowing in some West Texas dust. We'll take a close look at that and let you know how long these comfortable conditions will last coming up. A team of engineers at the University of Arizona wants to build a sort of doomsday vault. It would be filled with seeds, sperm, eggs, everything required to repopulate the species of plants and animals that live on Earth. They're so worried about a global cataclysm that they want to bury this on the moon. Logistics hmm. for such an arc, as you might imagine, are complicated. Not only would it take 250 rocket launches to get samples from 6.7 million species to the lunar surface, the technology to keep it cold enough for long-term storage, that doesn't exist yet. Smaller versions of what they're talking about, they do already exist on Earth. Hmm. The British pop star Ed Sheeran's artwork raised thousands of dollars for a good cause. According to Billboard, the singer's abstract painting, Splash, Pam Splash Planet, was sold at an auction in England, raising more than $70,000 for a cancer charity in Suffolk. The painting was one of the images featured on the cover of his 2020 Afterglow single. Sheeran said he began painting after his Divide tour, which lasted almost two years from March 2017 to August of 2019. Lyft wants to get involved to help get people in need with a vaccine, a COVID-19 shot. The rideshare giant is offering a new program to let users book a Lyft ride to get their COVID-19 vaccine or fund a ride for other people. Nonprofit partners like the United Way, the NAACP will help identify people who need a lift to get their shots. The organizations will prioritize at risk people from low income communities, minorities and seniors. Major brands like Hilton, Delta and Chase partnering with Lyft to offer incentives for their members to contribute to the cause. All Next right, today you might have a little luck of the Irish. It is St. Patrick's <laughs> Day at a time when many Americans celebrate their Irish heritage. About 33 million Americans self-identify as being of Irish ancestry. That's according to U.S. Census data. That's five times the number of people on the actual island of Ireland. The traditional celebrations more subdued this year because of social distancing and COVID-19. There are normally hundreds of parades across America to celebrate. Many, of course, have been canceled, but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy a Guinness and some corned beef and cabbage at home. And actually, I'm glad we're doing the St. Patrick's Day story right before weather because you might notice Adam Kasky isn't wearing green that we can see. <clears throat> or that we want to see. This? Oh, here we go. I'm just making sure you know it's St. Patrick's Day. It says good luck on the socks and it's got a shamrock. <laughs> Point taken, Kasky. You're welcome. No pinches for you. Exactly. We have the green screen, so what are we supposed to do? I got to wear gray and blue on St. Patrick's Day. I know it's unfortunate, but otherwise I would look like a weather map, so we can't do that. <laughs> Let's take a look at our time lapse here. Notice how our baby blue sky is starting to turn a little brown. Off in the distance there on the horizon, there's some dust moving into town. If you look off to the northwest, you're going to notice this dust as it moves in. You can see it center part of your screen on the satellite imagery here coming in from Midland, San Angelo area blowing through the hill country already now hitting the I-35 and Highway 90 corridor. So the dust is going to basically give us that extra haze in the air this evening and overnight tonight. And you may notice it on your car a bit uh, early tomorrow morning as well. It does sometimes coat our vehicles and whatnot that we have parked outside. If you're sensitive to the dust, just bear in mind it's going to be out there tonight and probably lasting into the early morning hours tomorrow. And it's all because of the strong northwesterly wind still steady at 25 miles per hour here in San Antonio. And that's really just the general rule of thumb here. Winds around 20 to 25 miles per hour, but the gusts are even higher. We're looking at gusts 
in the mid 30s. Even Catula recently gusting up to 43 miles per hour. And just about all these reporting sites, we've been seeing those gusts at times get to about that 40 mile per hour mark. So very breezy out there still. It's going to be breezy through the night, just not as gusty. We're looking at 20 to 30 mile per hour gusts opposed to the 40 mile per hour gusts. Even early tomorrow morning, we could have some gusts just squeak above 30 miles per hour and then the wind will pump the brakes a little bit as we get into tomorrow afternoon, but it's still going to be out of the north and northwest. So we just missed some decent rainfall last night. That line broke apart as it moved into San Antonio. This is the imagery from very early this morning, late last night, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and then about 5, 6 a.m. It broke apart around San Antonio, a few hundredths of an inch here and there. Didn't add up to much. I guess you could say better than nothing. But now this has turned into a severe weather situation in the southern states. We're talking Mississippi and Alabama in particular. Big severe weather outbreak has been ongoing throughout the day with confirmed tornadoes throughout uh, portions of Alabama. Now, on the flip side, though, on the cool side of the system, you know, we have that north wind, the cool wind. Look at that. See that blue? Snow in the panhandle. Amarillo, Dalhart area, even up into Guymon. Yeah, picking up some snows, checking with the National Weather Service office in Amarillo, and they had reports of anywhere from six to eight inches in and around Amarillo. And it's 38 degrees there right now, but then we're talking 88 in Corpus Christi and 87 in Laredo. So a big difference here because of that cold front that has moved through. 76 in San Antonio, 83 Catula, Kerrville at 66. So crisp and comfortable in the hill country, but you have the thick dust that's moving in overhead right now. You've had it for a few hours and we're going to see it here very soon. Tomorrow morning, temperatures dipping down into the upper 30s in parts of the hill country. A chill in the air. We'll start the day in Gonzales at 46, Uvalde 44. You get to Stone Oak about 47, 48 degrees. Timberwood Park 43 in the morning. Leon Springs 43, Bernie 41. So jacket weather in the morning by the afternoon, sunny and comfortable. Highs mostly in the lower 70s, even south of town, mid 70s, Elmendorf 73, Lasoya Von Army about 75. So a sunny day tomorrow, cool in the morning, pleasant in the afternoon, low humidity, still a bit breezy at times. And then temperatures really don't change a whole lot the next couple of days. Mornings low to mid 40s, afternoon highs low 70s, which is actually fairly close to average for this time of year. And then with this lack of humidity, unfortunately, no real rain chances. We have to wait till Monday night for a slight chance at best. All right, Adam, what are your favorite things that have to do with Ireland? Like, just give me one. I would say stouts. <laughs> yeah. My and, how did I know it was beer related? You're going to say you have, you have one? Uh, no, okay. I don't have anything. I, I think Guinness. Bad. Yep. You too. Yep. And Kathy, in case you missed it, coming up next. Ireland, get it, Kathy Ireland. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning to you. It is Wednesday, March 17th. It is also St. Patrick's Day, so happy St. Patrick's Day. Thanks for joining us today. A man is dead after he was shot in the head and stomach overnight. Now San Antonio police are looking for two suspects. San Antonio police say the victim and three other people got into an argument in one of the motel rooms. One of those people pulled out a gun and fired at the victim four times. A witness told investigators a man and woman ran from the scene. So far, there have not been any arrests. The victim's name hasn't been released either. Meantime, SAPD investigating another man's death. In this case, the man was found dead in the middle of South Hackberry and Martin Luther King Drive. Investigators say the man had a major head injury, and while they did not say what kind of injury, investigators did believe that they say that someone else had something to do with it. We're still working to learn the name of a man who died after he was thrown from his car this morning. San Antonio police say the driver crashed along Northwest Loop 410 at the I-10 exit ramp. It happened about 2.40 this morning. They say the man lost control, drove straight into the metal guardrail. He was not wearing a seatbelt. That's why he was thrown from his vehicle. While the bill did not get bipartisan support, President Biden told ABC's George Stephanopoulos during an interview about what's next on his legislative agenda. It includes a tax increase for wealthy Americans. Anybody making more than $400,000 will see a small to a significant tax increase. If you make more than less than $400,000, you won't see a federal, one single penny in additional federal tax.
More than a dozen states are reporting a rise in coronavirus cases. 14 states reporting double-digit increases in cases this week compared to last week. Half of those states saw the number of cases jump by more than 20 percent. In Michigan, cases rose by 50 percent. Nationwide, the number of new cases continues to decline, but that has slowed down a lot since earlier this year. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention projecting 554,000 to 574,000 could die from the virus by April 10th. That is down slightly from an earlier forecast, which projected up to 571,000 deaths by April 3rd. Europe needs tourism. The European Commission unveiling its vaccine passport. It's called the Digital Green Certificate. It's expected to offer a lifeline to the tourism industry, which has been decimated by the pandemic. The certificate will confirm that a person has been vaccinated against COVID-19 or received a negative test result or recovered from COVID-19. That can be used across all EU member states. Becoming dusty this evening. That West Texas dust is blowing into town. It'll be overhead through the night. Maybe give you a little extra dust on the windshield when you go outside tomorrow morning. Otherwise, sunny next several days, basically lasting into the weekend. Cool in the mornings, 40s, afternoons, low 70s. By the way, when I made my Kathy Ireland joke, <laughs> our director groaned. In my